from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Greetings to our listeners. My name is Lene Snege, and I'm the director of the Arts and Culture Center at the Middle East Institute. Today's podcast is one of the several programs coming out of our current exhibition, Converging Lines, Tracing the Artistic Lineage of the Arab American Diaspora, that opened on September 10 and will be up through November 17. Curated by writer, researcher, and curator Maimana Farhat, the exhibition, as she puts it very eloquently, features the work of artists belonging to the Arab diaspora in the United States who have long contributed to the development of American art since the early 20th century. Yet the story of this artistic community has rarely been considered. Converging Lines connects a diverse, multi-generational group of artists around themes of migration and the state of in-betweenness that often results. Beginning with the work of Khalil Gibran, a member of the earliest known Arab-American creative community, the exhibition explores how artists have used concepts like third spaces, community building, hybridity, and memory formation in works that allude to the complexities of migration. Featured artists in the exhibition include Khalil Gibran, Atal Adnan, Uget Kalan, and Kamal Bulata, Sam al Shaibi, Zaina Barake, Yasmin Nasser Diaz, Shireen Girgis, and others, and of course, our two guests today, which I will introduce shortly, Helen Zghaib and John Hala. For those who have not yet had the chance to see the show, it's up for another three weeks only, so if you are in D.C., come see the exhibition. It is a beautiful show. You can make an appointment on our site, www.mei.edu. The exhibition is also available to view online, although nothing beats seeing it in person. So I am joined today by two of our participating artists in the exhibition, Helen Zghaib and John Hala. Their work is shown side by side in our gallery, and I'm honored to host them today so we can bring them in conversation to speak about their work, the themes that drive their vision, and how this state of in-betweenness has affected their art and perhaps sometimes even made it possible. Helen and John, welcome to our podcast. It is such a pleasure to be in conversation with you. I want to introduce you briefly before we get right into it. Helen Zghaib is a Washington, D.C.-based artist who paints primarily in gouache and ink on board and canvas. Her work is motivated by her desire as an Arab American to encourage dialogue, create empathy, and bring understanding and acceptance between the people of the Arab world and the West. Zghaib has been widely exhibited in the United States, Europe, and Lebanon. Her paintings are included in the many private and public collections, including the White House, the World Bank, the Library of Congress, the Arab American National Museum in Michigan, and the Minneapolis Institute of Art. John Halaa is a visual artist working in the fields of drawing, painting, photography, film, and oral history, whose art practice adheres to the philosophy of the artist as public servant. His artwork is designed to provide an arena for meditation on survival and resistance as conditions that shape the life experiences of displaced populations. John Hala's artwork has been exhibited nationally and internationally in numerous solo and group exhibitions, including a solo show of his drawings at the Arab American National Museum. He is also the recent recipient of a Palestinian American Research Center Fellowship that supported the first phase of his work in the West Bank on a project titled Vanishing Harvest Meditations on the End of Palestinian Agriculture. Welcome to both of you on our podcast. It's a pleasure to host you today. Your two pieces, as I mentioned, are displayed side by side in our gallery. And in your pieces, which I will ask you to describe briefly to our audiences, you both use the written word rhythmically with repetition in an almost dizzying manner, as if to prevent something from disappearing or from being forgotten. And both were done in almost the same time, 2010 for you, Helen, and 2009 for you, John. I want to turn to you first, Helen. 
tell us about your piece in the show. If I may say it's unique to your practice, perhaps you can talk about it and talk about the context and circumstances that drove you to do this unique piece in 2010. Sure. And I want to thank Middle East Institute and Maimana and Yulin and Kate and John. It's such an honor to speak with you today. I love the introduction and I love, Lynn, that you said that our paintings are side by side. And um, John and I decided that they talk together at nighttime. (laughs) So this is interesting to talk about work and not see it. So I hope you come to the exhibit and see our work there. In 1975, I was evacuated with my mother and my two sisters from the Civil War in Lebanon, and we left my father there. And when we were leaving, I looked at him and he said that we would be back in a week. And I believed him, of course. And that week actually turned to about 35 years. I never went back. The war lasted and things happened. And finally, I was invited to exhibit my work at the wonderful Ajial Gallery with Saleh Barakat. And it was my first trip home. And in fact, we called the show Journey Home and Back Again. And in thinking about what I could do for that exhibit and bringing up all these memories, the more recent ones, were quite traumatic. I know we've talked about that, Lynn, about leaving and being forced to leave your home. And as Lynn said in the introduction, it is that piece, Beit, I called it Circle Home, but all my community of Arabs here call it Beit, which means home in Arabic. And I I was thinking of that word, home. And as my father told me in Arabic, that word encompasses not just the physical structure where you live, but it's mean your your larger family, the village, the community, and the cultural identity that you have from that place. And so here I am now in Washington, D.C., thinking I'm going to go back to Lebanon for the first time. And I have no idea how that painting started, but I started by writing the word bait in Arabic over and over and over again in a methodical, very meticulous, actually painful way for me. My hand was cramped and hurt, and I almost tried to stop many times, but I just kept going and thinking about what I left behind, where I am, what could I expect when I finally go back to my home, my bait, after 35 years. And as I kept going, it became like a a meditation. And I love that you compared our works, Lynn, with the idea of, of writing down the words so it doesn't disappear. You know, it was like I was trying to reconjure it. I just love that idea of forcing home on the page so we can actually see it. And in my case, it's black and white. Well, it's concentric circles and this idea of almost if you drop a pebble in the water and it spreads out and these circles and circles radiate out, you know, you started at the beginning and then your life grows and grows and grows. And that in betweenness, where is home, all these things I was asking in that painting, I could go on and on, but I want I want to hear what John has to say too. About his piece, exactly. Thank you, Helen. It's it's an absolutely stunning piece and, and the feedback of of you know audiences coming into the gallery and looking at your piece and looking at John's piece, your piece almost like turning dervishes, right? in this circular shape of bait, 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 repeating as if almost for it not to be forgotten. Turning to you, John, could you talk to us about your piece and perhaps talk to us about what it it hides so much more than what it first reveals to the viewer, right? When you get close again, you know, one sees this word. Why don't you talk to us about your piece Uh, and bring it to life to our audiences, if you can. Sure, I would be very happy to. But first, let me thank you for the invitation to be here. It's really a 
pleasure to be in conversation with you and Helen about our work and about our exhibit. And to listen to Helen, she's one of my very favorite artists, especially Arab American artists in this country. And I, I love the fact that her piece and my piece are hanging side by side. And that was a brilliant decision, I think, on Maimena's part. Because we're both using a word and a repeated word, a word that is repeated so much that it almost becomes meaningless. But at the same time, it persists and insists on being seen and being heard. So to contextualize my drawing up there, and it's a drawing on canvas of a ruin from the village of Kufr Bedaim in the northern Galilee. And it's a drawing from a series that has, I don't know, maybe like 40 or 50 drawings. All of them are of ruins, and the series is called Landscapes of Desire. And the ruins appear at first kind of like these historical ancient ruins, like something that you would see in photographs or in old romantic paintings from the early 19th century, where there's a sense of like uh, nostalgia for a past that could never be achieved, right? So it, the, the composition is deliberately, all the compositions in the series are deliberately kind of seductive. They kind of suggest something that is really old and yet very accessible. And in that sense, it kind of seduces the viewer to come close and to look at it and feel really quite comfortable and relaxed until they get up close. And then there's a word that sort of pokes them in the eye. So it's a sense of seduction and kind of slight shock, you know, and words can vary from piece to piece. So it's usually one word, occasionally two, but they there are words like resist, return, persist, survive, remember. And the words are rubber stamped one word at a time to construct the entire drawing, the entire landscape. So from a distance, you can't read anything. And, and you can't really read it until you get a very intimate with the drawing, six to eight inches from it, right? And then there's this word, and the image disintegrates, and then the word becomes the dominant element. And it forces the viewer, in a sense, to question what is this place? What is this thing that I thought was ancient? And what is this word telling me to think about? You know, what am I supposed to reflect on when it says return? Return from where? Return to where? Persist or resist? What is the resistance? So that the viewer is sort of seduced and then thrown slightly off balance and simultaneously when they get up close. And the images kind of forces the viewer to become in a sense, a witness to ethnic cleansing, a witness to destruction, a witness to a cultural genocide that keeps occurring over and over and has been occurring for over 70 years in Palestine. And the entire series is based on images of destroyed Palestinian villages that I went and searched for and photographed and kind of really had to spend a lot of time looking for these places. And some of them, they were easy to find, like Kofit Berem, because I interviewed people from that village and they took me to the ruins of the village. And other places, they're so wiped out that you have to drive around, compare 1948 maps to present maps and try to figure out, all of a sudden you come across this hill that has got a lot of stones in it. And then you walk into it and you realize that these are stones that were cut by hand and they formed the homes of this village that had been there maybe three, 400 years, and all of a sudden it was ethnically cleansed and destroyed. So the images sort of force us to, to reconsider the sense of the nostalgic with the sense of the crisis, the, the crisis of politics, the crisis of ethnic cleansing. One of the things that I try to do in the image by using the word over and over and over is to create this very rhythmic pulsating quality to the surface of the drawing. So it's not smooth at all. It's not tonally smooth or as in like some recognizable landscape. It almost seems like restless, a restless field of marks. And with that in mind, like especially when you get up close, it looks like the drawing itself that is in front of your eyes is sort of disintegrating. It's like disappearing. It's becoming dismembered in front of your eyes and, and vanishing. So in that sense, that crisis, that political crisis becomes amplified, but also potentially the opposite is true, is that the drawing is becoming sort of materialized, connected, becoming visible in front of your eyes because of your political will and consciousness to keep this memory alive. 
Fantastic. I have a question, uh, John. And I mean, for Helen, it, it was really writing it and the pain of writing it so methodically, in, in a sense, the same thing. And in your case, I'm just imagining the motion of this rubber stamping, which is a process that you seem to use in other works, not only this work. What does the, the, the motion of rubber stamping maybe allude to? Is it, you know, the stamp of approval, of acquisition, of mobility that is granted to us or denied or taken away from us? Is, is there anything to say about that motion of stamping over and over again? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think initially the idea was that there was this, this reference that is official, almost industrial kind of process of approving, you know, getting that government approval, the government stamp. But at the same time, I wanted my hand, my writing to not be visible. It's very much visible in the way I construct the image, but I wanted something that the viewer could read that is separate from me so that they can kind of read their own story, their own narrative and their own relationship to this issue of survival or remembering or persistence. So that that duality of wanting to get that official stamp, but also that sense of an image that the artist is not necessary. I kind of want the image to feel like it's been there before I was born and will continue to be there long after I'm forgotten. Thank you. Thank you for that, for both. I want to talk a little bit about this for, with both of you, this, this in-betweenness, this cultural hybridity and dual identity that comes so strongly in, in your work. Your work is also grounded and rooted in themes of human rights, of social justice, displacement, and in changing this dominant narrative around those issues, especially for the people of the Middle East. So, Helen, you have two big bodies of work that really touch upon this very strongly, migration series and stories my father told me, which are inspired by your own family story, perhaps, and the harrowing experience of Syrian refugees shortly after the war in 2011. And there has been a lot of juxtaposition between those two series, your work, and the work of Jacob Lawrence's migration series. Tell us a bit about those two series briefly. And this, this comparison that was done, has it made your message and narrative more accessible to people in the U.S. in this way? That's a really interesting question. I mean... If I go back to what I said a little bit earlier, when I finally went back to Lebanon in 2010, I also went to Syria, where my father was born in Damascus, and to Jordan. And when I came back a few months after that, we had the quote-unquote Arab Spring begin. And so after the sort of heady initial days of optimism and, and hope for a change in the Arab world, as we all know, much of that didn't work out and to the contrary, ended up in a horrible, horrible war in Syria, which people don't think about anymore. But it sort of alludes to what John was saying with his piece. You know, this is ongoing. This is ongoing. They're bombing, they're shelling. People are continually being displaced there, especially in Idlib. There was a bombing in Damascus. But these things, but they're not on the front page of the news and you know how fast it moves. You just, it goes in one ear and out the other ear, which I like again to what John said about the almost permanence of what we're trying to do as artists. It's like a recording. It's like a, a visual recording of what is going on and what we hope to keep for the future, and what we hope to learn for the future. So as the war continued, in Syria and caused the massive, massive death and displacement of close to 13 million people in such a short span of time. Based here in Washington, we are privileged to have half of Jacob Lawrence's migration, great migration series at the Phillips Collection. And that, that series, for anybody who's listening and wants to go check it out, it's amazing. He's an African-American painter. He's now dead. He died several years ago. I actually had the good fortune and honor to meet him at his retrospective. But, you know, I began studying more closely his migration series, which traced in his narrative and very strong sort of graphic style 
He also used gouache and tempera on board. And I love that we are in comparison there as well. But he traced the movement and the migration after World War I up until about 1970 of the African Americans from the rural South to the industrialized North. And they moved for Jim Crow laws to get away from segregation. You know, the policies of the South were very detrimental and moved for more opportunity. And in comparison, when I was looking at that and seeing the impacts of that migration in our cities, you know, I mean, first of all, when they got there, it was the grass wasn't necessarily greener on the other side. I mean, they were still facing, you know, segregation and so on in the North as well. But I started thinking about why people move. And in the case of Syrians, okay, they are fleeing for their safety from war. In Jacob Lawrence's narration and his panels, it's another kind of a war. Yes, it's a war against them, not with bombs necessarily, but with policies, with segregation rules that cut off their knees at every turn and twist. And so moving through Jacob Lawrence's and trying to parallel things like starvation, things like conflict, even the beginnings of the revolution. I mean, there were riots in St. Louis as well and fighting between blacks and whites. And so I went through and echoed many of his particular themes and marks up until the 60th panel. I think now in my migration series, which I call Syrian Migration Series, I have about 43 pieces now. And very interestingly, Jacob Lawrence's paintings haven't died since the last one he painted, which was in 1941. It's We're still talking about these issues. Look what's happened in the past summer with the Black Lives Matter movement. I think, you know, Lynn, to answer your question, I think that movement, those paintings bring what has happened in Syria even closer and the ability for people in America to relate. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree, Helen, because they they also globalize. You know, this is a global, you know, we are seeing, you know, the displacement of people is is now everywhere. The, The reasons are different, but in a sense, the reason why we flee are almost the same, right? Yeah. And people don't do it just for nothing, you know. I mean, here, John and I, I don't want to interrupt you, but John and I are talking about the ideas of home and disappeared home, villages destroyed, villages changed, people change, cultural suppression. You know, a home is who we are. And, you know, you don't just take it lightly to one day pick up and leave, especially, I mean, you don't. Yes, absolutely. And you try to to flee somewhere where you hope to make another home or a better home or a, or a home that you can identify with. Yeah, but always with wanting to go back to home, to return to home too. I mean, there's, uh, again, echoing John's piece of returning. You know, yeah, we leave, we think it's going to be this amount of time. I thought it was going to be a week. And you want to come back too. Absolutely. There is always this yearning and what you take with you to make a home somewhere else and how you make it. But this is a good segue to you, John. I want to talk to you about some of your processes uh, because they're quite immersive in the manner in which you develop your projects and you, you know, you, you are uh, someone that characterizes yourself as an artist activist and your work has long challenged the dominant narrative around Palestinians in the West, and you continue to raise awareness about the plight and rights of Palestinians. And you you don't only work in painting and drawing, you work in film and photography and oral history. So share with us a little bit about your very immersive process and perhaps talk about one of your series that are you're, you're still working on and developing, such as Landscape of Resistance or or Vanishing Harvest that I mentioned earlier in your bio? Sure, I'd be happy to. I think I always think of myself as a painter or a drawer. That's sort of the core of what I do and who I am as a visual artist. But 
I think probably about close to 20 years ago. And even though I was making paintings and images about displacement, about resistance, about anti-colonial struggle, I realized that it was all sort of stuff that was coming out of secondary research. I was reading a whole lot. I was researching all kinds of histories. But it wasn't until I began to travel to Palestine on a regular basis, and I was not born in Palestine. My, my father's family is Palestinian, but I was born in Egypt. And it wasn't until I started to travel to Palestine and to speak with the people that I realized that everything I was doing was nothing but sort of this very faint shadow of the reality that I was hearing on the ground. So I quickly came back the following year with a camera and a microphone and began to record stories. And ever since then, the stories have been central to my work. So there's a process that, that has evolved. I record stories. I go and walk around. I, went, I go to villages. And I spent a good chunk of time in Lebanon recording stories of Palestinian refugees there, but also in the West Bank in, in 1948 Palestine in Jordan. I had intended to go to Syria, but the civil war kind of made that impossible. But this idea of collecting narrative, recording stories that have not been heard, right, essentially reshaped my whole approach to my work. So they were not simply kind of like in the past when I would, had made images of refugees, they were kind of these anonymous figures. But then they became real human beings, individuals, men and women from various generations that had lived through the experience. And it was their stories that I wanted to be heard. So I started creating these oral history archives. And I'm not a historian, but I really strongly am connected to this lowercase history, the personal history, as opposed to sort of uppercase history that goes in the book, you know. And I'm not a filmmaker, but I felt the need to kind of begin to put together these stories in a way that, that made them accessible to others. So essentially, the work is about, it's a way of sort of listening to the unheard and drawing the unseen, you know, so that others can listen to them as well. So I've made it, in a sense, my priority to become a witness so that others can also witness these realities that remain uh, muffled these narratives that remain suppressed and these histories that have been largely erased. So the interviews inform my drawings, they inform my paintings, and they inform the photographic images. So I found that being on the ground really transformed my work from being just drawing and painting to incorporating photography to incorporating oral history work and documentary filmmaking. And but I still constantly come back to my studio to draw and that's exactly like right when we started recording i'm working on this group of drawings and i had to remind myself that oh yeah no i need to stop so we can do this podcast but that's where i feel most at home is at my drawing table in front of the wall where i'm working on a painting and strangely you know this last two years or year and a half it's been two years since i went to palestine late nine 2019, with COVID, it's really disrupted this process, right? Where I would go at least once a year, often twice a year, and go into the community. So I'm working on this project with Palestinian farmers, recording their stories, because they really have rarely been heard. And there's a massive crisis in Palestinian agriculture that in a way forecast the crisis in Palestinian culture. And that, that's a story in and out of itself. So I, I, I've been going there. I started in 2019. I spent five months in Palestine just going to villages, recording stories of farmers. And I had been planned to go back over and over, but all of a sudden that was disrupted by COVID. So what happens? I went right back to my drawing table, to my shelter, to my little uh, comfort blanket, so to speak, of, of working in my drawings. So yeah, I think that I don't like the term multidisciplinary because it has all kinds of temporary art implications that I don't participate in. But I work, I incorporate multiple approaches in terms of my research and multiple approaches in terms of the reflection and the production of my work. Thank you, John. And, and, and you too, John and Helen, and you said it, John, you give voice to those who are often invisible 
in the news and in in society and in and and you bring those issues out with such beauty and grace and humanity and in my closing sort of questions question to both of you i want to get your reflection and you've touched upon this a little bit john the world has gone through a lot of changes those last couple of years of course the pandemic and its catastrophic ramifications on especially on the communities that you both talk about and draw about and write about, layered over all the other problems related to the rise of populism and other hostile narratives with regards to the other, to the politics of fear that has been used like never before. How has this mood affected you too? Has it made you more determined in what you do or has it left you feeling more hopeless? And then has it triggered new projects or new things that you're immersed with because of the need of this work? How how has it left you feeling, Helen? Wow, we need like three more hours. La Habibti, it's okay. I mean, for me, I think certainly the pandemic has exacerbated 1,000 million times the situation of the uh, refugee crisis, whether it's in Syria or Lebanon or on our own border, you know, on top of everything, they are dealing with that. And one can certainly visualize a makeshift tent with, you know, 20 people trying to keep out of the sun in the winter. Obviously, there's no social distancing there. That certainly is one thing. But I do think that this time has made me more convinced than ever, especially with no, I don't know, not hopeless, but no seeming solution in sight. And, and, and almost weirdly, as you said, too, we're talking now about Afghanistan. We're talking about the Rio Grande and the crossing on our southern border. And, and John is, is in California. He's closer to that than I am here on the east. But, you know, that global humanitarian crisis, for whatever reason, whether it's poverty, whether it's climate change, I'm interested in John's project with the Palestinian farmers. I'm, you know, one of the huge reasons for that that was almost a spark that lit up this the Syrian war was the fact that, and nobody really talks about it, was the fact that for a few years they had been suffering a massive drought. And so in the beginning of the revolution, in the in the very beginning of those early days after the gra- graffiti and data, about a million farmers came in into the city of Damascus. Of course, they were already suffering. There was nothing, there were no work for them. There was no work for them no jobs, which just exacerbated everything. So I feel, in a sense, an urgency. You know, it's funny, I don't consider myself an activist, but I love what John said about being almost like a public servant, because I think that is our duty, you know, as an artist, is to tell these stories. I mean, John mentioned storytelling. For me, it's in my bones, in my genes, after my father, stories my father told me. I think storytelling, getting it down to that intimate level and with the ability for people to relate, even take that photograph, that incredibly tragic photograph of Island Kurdi. I hope I'm not jumping around too much, but there is a lot of components to your question. That, that photograph of the little boy, Aylan, the Syrian boy, three years old, with his shoes on, washed up on the Turkish shore, found by the Turkish, you know, for about 10 minutes, it, it rallied the world and thinking, ah, this is a big problem. We need to stop it. Then we had the one on the Rio Grande with the father holding his little girl dead in the river there trying to cross. I mean, I think these very intimate images are crucial to making a connection for the viewer as opposed to saying, you know, 13 million people. It doesn't mean anything. Even 100 people doesn't mean anything. But one person or one shoe or one story like John is telling with the Palestinian refugees he's interviewing, this is what we can relate to. So for me, I feel more convicted than ever to keep this alive, keep these voices out there. 
and speak for them in the way that I do. And also, too, like John, it's that almost seductive, if you want to say beauty or visual attractiveness of the piece. And then I bring you, I sneak you, sneak you closer, and then you hear what I'm trying to say. I think John and I both do a similar kind of thing in, in different ways. I think you answered beautifully, Helen. Thank you so much for that. John, I'd lo love to get your reflections on that, on how this, this mood those last couple of years have left you whether more determined in what you do or left you feeling more hopeless and whether it has triggered new projects or new thinking for you. I, I wish that I could say it's left me just completely determined and energized to go further. But at the same time, I think it's the, this combination of four days a week, I feel hopeless <laughs> and three days a week, I feel maybe hopeful. It's, it's been a really hard time. And, not just because of COVID, although COVID has been, has exacerbated the process of muffling the voices of the oppressed because they've become even more distant, you know, their reality has become even more erased and they've been rendered more invisible because of this distance of COVID. But I think the rise in nationalism, and it's not just in this country, but globally, is one of my biggest worries because it's moments of crisis that allow fascist regimes to make massive changes, to capitalize on the crisis, on the divisions, and to make massive changes. So part of me is in a state of despair. And part of me says, oh, hell no, we're going we're gonna to fight. And so I've been working over the last two years, actually on a drawing project that I started before 2019, where I've been doing these drawings on maps. One group of drawings is on maps of the United States, and one group of drawings on maps of Palestine. And the images honor scholars, artists, activists, and migrant farmers, African American, Native American, and brown Americans on maps of the US, and then the equivalent on maps of Palestine. Because so these drawings not only honor their work, they, they allow me to sort of immerse myself in this process of learning about them and learning from them, but also kind of underscoring the parallels between the subjugation and oppression of the indigenous people of the Americas, the horrific enslavement of Africans that became a very central core of America, and this invisible population of migrant workers that feed us on a daily basis. There's nothing that we eat. Whatever we had for breakfast or lunch today was touched and cultivated by the hand of an invisible person, invisible to us, who is living in really miserable conditions. And so I, I wanted to, in this project that I'm working on, to kind of underscore the parallels between the experience of Palestinians as an indigenous population, occupied, displaced, discriminated against, and the experiences in the U.S. of native uh, population, African-American population, and brown population of, of migrant workers that feed us. I think that project gives me hope, and maybe it's, I'm delusional to think that it gives me hope, but it gives me hope because we have to survive. The Native American scholar, if I can just maybe I'll, I'll shut up in a minute, Native American scholar Gerald Visnor coined this word survivance, combination of survival and resistance. And he, he speaks of the inseparable process of resisting to survive and surviving to resist when you're a colonized population. So we have to survive, we have to resist. That term survivance is critical to the future, not only of indigenous populations in this land and in Palestine, but the future of humanity, because the extermination of indigenous population is a prelude to our extermination as a race. Absolutely, John. And I, I, I'm going to use your note of hope and survival and continuation to conclude our conversation today. It's been wonderful to speak to you both. I want to thank you both for joining our podcast. And I want to thank you for all the work that you do with such grace and humanity and beauty. Good luck to you both. And thank you again for joining us and for our audiences. Please check our exhibition and the work of our two guests today on our site, www.mei.edu, Arts and Culture Center, 
and follow us on social media, Twitter at MEI Arts Culture. Thank you so much, Habibti Lynn. This was wonderful. Thank you, John. Thank you, Lynn. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support. Thank you.